Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum. You're watching News Room. I'm your host, Sumakhal Ilpa. Today is the 29th of July, 2021. And these are the stories that we'll be discussing during the course of our show. We'll begin uh, with the human rights abuses and plight of minorities as far as India is concerned. We know that Anthony Blinken, the US Secretary of State, is in India. And this is one of the things that he highlighted as far as the human rights abuses is concerned. He talked about the human rights uh, record, the bad human rights record as far as India is concerned. And he uh, has highlighted this in his meeting with the different personalities in the neighboring country. Now, which effect is it going to have as far as the U.S.-India relations is concerned? Or will it have any effect at all on the current uh, human rights abuses that India is perpetuating over its minorities, especially the Muslims in Indian illegally occupied Jammu and Kashmir and across India? This is going to be our leading segment. Then, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be talking about uh, uh, the Afghan Taliban. We know that uh, delegation is in uh, China. And uh, both Pakistan and China are pushing the Afghan Taliban to break their ties with the terrorist groups, whether it be the East Turkmenistan Islamic Movement or the ETIM or the Tehreek Taliban Pakistan and all other such outfits that pose a direct or indirect threat to these countries and uh, the region. At the same time, Prime Minister Imran Khan very recently while talking to an Afghan media delegation during the conclave said that Pakistan cannot be held responsible for the actions of the Taliban in the aftermath of the US and its allies ongoing withdrawal from Afghanistan. He also said that the government is not a spokesperson for the militant group. This is going to be our second segment. And then, ladies and gentlemen, we will be talking about uh, COVID-19 and uh, how the fourth wave is impacting Pakistan and different uh, areas and districts of the country. There are measures that the government is now putting into place, uh, whether it be uh, the ban of uh, those who are not vaccinated to travel via air from the 1st of August or other such measures. We'll be talking about that in our third story. Let's begin with our first segment, ladies and gentlemen, and that concerns the human rights violations in India, especially those of minorities. More in the following report. The persistent backsliding of Indian democracy illustrates the deterioration of political and civil liberties in the country. American intransigence to directly criticize the Indian government raised speculations regarding duplicious rhetoric of superpower or the fundamental freedoms. Marking a dramatic development, U.S. Secretary of the State Antony Blinken cautiously pressed India on Wednesday about its incessant democratic recession and the dismal human rights violations in his first official visit to New Delhi. Blinken stated that democracies should always seek to strengthen our democratic institutions, expand access to justice and opportunity, stand up forcefully for the fundamental freedoms. India Prime Minister Narendra Modi's government is overwhelmed under the mounting allegations that it has crippled dissent, pursued divisive policies to appeal to its Hindu nationalist base, and orchestrated anti-Muslim policies besides oppressing other minorities and low-caste Hindu groups. Washington has long viewed India as a key partner in efforts to blunt the increasing Chinese assertiveness in the region. The colossal stumbling block in forging durable India-US global strategic partnership is the fast-paced erosion of India's pluralistic ethos after the ascent of Hindu nationalist BJP government to the power. Human rights activists assert that there is a growing climate of hate and intolerance in India and the US must castigate India for corroding diversity and democratic values. Prior to U.S. top diplomats' visit to India, Dean Thompson, the State Department's Acting Assistant Secretary for South and Central Asian Affairs, told the reporters that the U.S. will continue to have conversation with Indian side on human rights because these were the common values for the both countries. It is cogent to mention here that the U.S. State Department's latest human rights report on India, the self-styled world's largest democracy released in March, cited the gross violations of fundamental human rights. Now, to talk more about the human rights abuses in India and whether uh, the uh, visit of Anthony Blinken to India is going to have any effect whatsoever as far as the decrease in these human rights abuses is concerned, we've been joined by Lieutenant General Retired Reza Mohammad Khan Saab. He's a senior analyst, sir. Thank you very much to have joined us. Anthony Blinken uh, is in India. He gave a few statements that were, of course, uh, uh, quite harsh as far as Indian uh, uh, civil rights, Indian human rights abuses are concerned. Do you feel that this is going to have any effect whatsoever on the human rights abuses that India is perpetuating on its minorities? Okay, Bismillah, uh, I think, first of all, 
the issue of uh, human rights abuses uh, by India uh, was, I think, uh, only a tertiary matter of discussion uh, among uh, the U.S. and the Indian officials. Essentially, I think Mr. Blinken was there to talk more uh, about the U.S.-Indo cooperation on containment of China uh, and uh, also on trying to convince or elicit some kind of support uh, from India on, quote-unquote, what he called stabilization of India. Uh, and we hope that uh, that uh, intended stabilization of India and Afghanistan doesn't turn out to be the destabilization of Afghanistan. Yes, I think in uh, a very diplomatic, uh, mild manner, uh, I think uh, the Indian uh, uh, inadequacies uh, in their human rights records uh, were pointed out uh, uh, to them. But I think the U.S. Uh, Secretary of State uh, could have actually be, uh, he could have been more straightforward and more candid and directly communicated uh, to India about the misuse of its anti-terror and sedition laws to arrest campaigners, journalists, students, and uh, any dissidents or anyone who is criticizing uh, the BJP's failure of its governance, its economy, its, its failures in the pandemic, uh, the atrocities that were perpetrated uh, on the demonstrations against the CAA, uh, changing the status uh, of uh, the Indian health Kashmiris, uh, and the massive uh, internet blockages there, the lynching of Muslims on mere suspicion of possession of beef or eating of beef and making the Indian Muslims, the 200, uh, 200 million Muslims chant, you know, Hindu slogans like Jai Shri Ram, and branding them as adversaries and subservient to Hindus. And not only that, uh, but also the Indian farmers and all other Indian minorities, particularly the Dalits and even the Christians. All these have been very clearly pointed out uh, in the uh, April 2021 report of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, uh, which has once again recommended that India be placed on a blacklist for religious freedom. So I think all these aspects should have been clearly pointed out to them. One can only hope that these have been communicated to them, but they have not been made uh, public. And uh, I think the issue of the misuse of Pegasus software by India... That's a very important point, the misuse of Pegasus for, you know, uh, to use against uh, those activists who have been... Uh, uh, talking forthrightly about the human rights abuses in India, the journalists who have been talking about it, the minorities, and so on and so forth, even uh, leaders uh, whose phone have been tapped uh, through this Pegasus software. This is just one of the different measures that India has been uh, taking in order to curb the rights of the minorities in its country. Now, the United States of America, uh, sir, uh, that considers itself to be... Uh, uh, huge democracy and we've seen uh, the Black Lives Matter movement there as well and the impact that it had as far as a change in the stance is concerned in the in the government. Can we see something of that sort in India as well through pressure tactics by the US on India? I think uh, right now India is actually uh, taking advantage of the US efforts to use it as a proxy against China. Uh, in fact, in the past, I think uh, President Trump had given it a blank check to do whatever it wanted to do against anyone, including its own minorities, and particularly the Muslims and the Kashmiris. Uh, but there is a slight difference, you know, in the policies and the attitude of the present U.S. administrations because of uh, the human rights uh, being very uh, near to them. Uh, so we hope that it will make certain difference, uh, although publicly I think uh, this has not been pointed out. But, uh, you know, when the journalist questions uh, the U.S. South Asia representative in D.C., uh, I think he pointed out that uh, all these issues uh, would be taken up 
uh, with the Indian administration. And perhaps that is the reason why Mr. Jay Shankar, uh, during the joint conference, uh, press conference with Anthony Blinken, uh, he was forced actually to defend its policies again in very diplomatic terms by saying that, uh, you know, they are trying to reverse the wrongs of history, uh, which again was totally illogical. Uh, in fact, they are creating wrong history all by themselves. Uh, so I think to let India do whatever it is doing, uh, I think this, this has been criticized uh, by all free world journalists uh, and the media. And I think it will go against the interest of not India, uh, but also of the United States. Uh, if India is continued to tread on this path, uh, which can actually endanger the, the, the security of India, and I think uh, the security of Quad itself, because if one of the members, which is supposed to be one of the largest democracies of the world, is actually becoming uh, an autocracy, uh, then uh, I think uh, that Quad uh, India does not to uh, does not deserve to be part of the court or any other organizations that is supposed to be represented by democracies. Now, whether it be the Quad Go Group uh, that, of course, uh, India is part of, whether it be other alliances that India is part of along with the United States, whether it be the civil nuclear deal that both the countries have signed, whether it be the different deals, important deals that have been signed over the years as well. Uh, we have uh, grown up to see that the uh, U.S. considers India as a very important strategic partner in the region, of course, to counter China. But will it be at the expense of human rights abuses? Or will at some point of time, whether it be through this uh, remark by Anthony Blinken, will there be other such pressure uh, points or tactics made by the U.S. government on India so that it curbs what, uh, of course, the world is seeing as abuses on the different minority segments of its society? I think uh, there is a price for everything. And uh, I think the price that the world and the U.S. and the Indian minorities will have to pay uh, for uh, the Indo-US uh, friendship uh, is that the human rights are continue to be, they will continue to be violated. Uh, and uh, I think now because uh, the United States is expecting uh, India to provide its uh, intelligence, uh, to share intelligence with it, uh, whether through its embassy in Afghanistan or uh, whether uh, through its uh, raw assets in uh, many of the Afghan consulates, uh, or whether it is through, uh, you know, uh, giving secret bases to uh, the United States uh, in India. I think these, these aspects are again uh, going to weigh on the Indian, on the US policies, uh, whether they are uh, going to ignore uh, these kinds of violation by India, or whether they will censor India. I think uh, it will be very difficult for the United States to actually censor India if it continues to depend on India uh, for the so-called stabilization of Afghanistan in the future and for the containment of China. Oh, yeah, you talked about the bases uh, that the U.S. wants in the region, and of course we know that Pakistan has outrightly refused uh, through a statement by Prime Minister Imran Khan that there will be no basis of any kind uh, of the U.S. in Pakistan. And you said, of course, that uh, the U.S. is trying to have some kind of a presence in the region. So maybe uh, at the expense of human rights abuses, uh, they will uh, let uh, India... Uh, do whatever it wants, if, if it uh, give, provides them with bases, if it provides them with some kind of a sanctuary for uh, uh, those Afghan segments that the U.S. wants to continue uh, talking with or working with in Afghanistan once the U.S. is completely out of the country. Do you feel that as far as Afghanistan is concerned, the U.S. is also going to give a free rein to India as far as influencing TTP or IS is concerned? I think that is a possibility. It's a, it's, a, it's a possibility which is a plausible possibility. But I think that will be, again, a strategic blunder, uh, both by the United States as well as India, uh, because they actually would be violating and opposing the Doha agreement between the Taliban and the United States and uh, the, uh, the Troika Plus agreement, which was signed uh, among Russia, China, the United States, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. Uh, and I think that has 
the support of the United Nations also. Uh, so I think all this uh, would not augur well uh, for the peace process in Afghanistan and it could actually endanger the entire peace process uh, there. And uh, I think the earlier both the United States as well as India learns uh, from whatever has happened in Afghanistan uh, for the last 20 years, the better it would be for them uh, for peace in the subcontinent and also uh, for peace in Asia. Hmm. All right. Now, sir, also uh, when we talk of human rights abuses, let's come back to that. Uh, and let's come to United Nations and its role as well. Michel Bachelet has been uh, talking about it since some time. We know of the reports that have been presented in the United Nations as well as far as the human rights abuses perpetrated by India are concerned. We know about the different NGOs that have put forward the uh, reports on human rights abuses. Do they have no impact whatsoever? I think the impact is there. The impact is very much there and it is being felt uh, by them. And it is not only, you know, uh, diplomatic and political pressures from the United States. It is also there from the UN, the Human Rights Commission, the HRW, from Amnesty International, from the EU Human Rights Commission, from the OIC and many other countries, uh, I think, who are actually friends of India. But the issue is that I think because of uh, the U.S. supports and because of the lack of any economic pressures on India, whether it is from the U.S. Uh, or from the OIC, uh, for obvious reasons, you know, because they want to benefit uh, from the large uh, Indian uh, uh, trade and all that. So that is an issue, you know, uh, because of which I think India continues to violate human rights uh, with All impunity. Right. All right. Thank but you very much, sir. We'll be back, but after a short break. Stay tuned. Welcome back. And in our second segment, we are going to discuss uh, uh, the recent talks that have been held between the Afghan Taliban and different countries, especially with China and the pressure that has been put on them uh, through China and Pakistan to disband their ties with uh, such groups that are trying to create havoc within the country and in the region. More in the following report. The security situation in Afghanistan is dramatically deteriorating following the incumbent U.S. President Joe Biden's order to withdraw all U.S. troops out of the country by September. Sensing the impending security vacuum in the country that might pose dangerous ramifications for regional countries, Pakistan and China are timely pressing Afghan Taliban to indiscriminately cut their ties with all the terror proxies. The purported presence of militant outfits, particularly outlaw terror groups Tariqe Taliban Pakistan and East Turkestan Islamic movement and other proscribed terror outfits in Afghanistan seriously jeopardized security and stability of both Pakistan and China. The banned militant group Tahrik-e Taliban Pakistan still has about 6,000 trained fighters on the Afghan side of the border, warns a recent report prepared for the United Nations Security Council. The 28th report of the UN Analytical Support and Sanctions Monitoring Team also confirms the presence of hundreds of anti-Beijing Muslim militants close to Afghanistan's border with China. TTP is traditionally located in the eastern districts of Nangarhar province, near the border with Pakistan. The irrefutable evidence regarding TTP presence in Afghanistan requires concrete action from Afghan government against the group. It is pertinent to mention here that the Afghan Taliban have in recent days seized vast swathes of land, including major border crossings and important security checkposts hitherto controlled by Afghan security apparatus. Following battlefield momentum in post-U.S. withdrawal country, Taliban's have garnered international standing. The latest regional giant to host them was China, which expects the group to play an important role in the process of peaceful reconciliation. UN monitors note that TTP has distinctive anti-Pakistan objectives, but also supports the Afghan Taliban militarily inside Afghanistan against Afghan government forces. Now to talk more about uh, this disbanding of uh, the terror outfits in Afghanistan, whether it be the TTP or whether it be the ETIM or different other outfits, we've been joined by Dr. Salma Malik. She's a foreign affairs expert. Dr. Saiba, thank you very much to have joined us. Dr. Saiba, what impact do you feel that uh, the visit of the Afghan Taliban delegation to China 
and of course uh, the pressure that is coming from Pakistan and Russia will have on the Afghan Taliban disbanding their ties with the terror outfits. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Umar, for your uh, uh, taking me in um, and uh, considering my views. Um, well, you see, it's not going to be a very easy uh, situation for the Taliban either. Uh, even uh, when the Taliban were in power the first time over and uh, uh, they were being uh, uh, sanctioned and they were being punished for the 9-11 episode, uh, given that the fact that it was the Al-Qaeda and uh, many of its operators who were the main uh, considered culprits uh, in this particular uh, action. Uh, and people would ask Mullah Umar and his cahoots as to why uh, they shielded the uh, Al-Qaeda and said that, well, we did uh, give them the option of leaving the country, but uh, unless and until to leave the country themselves, we would not have been the one to kick them out of uh, Afghanistan soil because of the Pashtun belly code and all of those things that, that go with the tribal as well as Pashtun culture, that one can say. So I, I would kind of like uh, uh, sort of take refuge into that situation as well, that it's not going to be again easy for them. But of course, today's Taliban are far more pragmatic, but the very fact that the cultural connotations still hold true, plus the fact that there's a lot of illicit economy uh, that uh, attracts such uh, militia groups and that, that and, uh, kind of makes them enter into a wedding of convenience. And um, uh, such international groups which have so much of money and potential power with them, uh, local groups uh, for them to distance for, uh, from, from these uh, larger uh, militia groups becomes a bit difficult. But of course, the Taliban are a very pragmatic people. They do understand that in the future, Afghanistan, China is going to be a major political actor as well as an economic actor. And uh, uh, the main game or the name of the game in Afghanistan is economy and the type of resources that Afghanistan holds. And uh, the lesson that we uh, read when we, we are, when we are looking at political economy of conflict is that the more these grounded things, the more is the uh, power struggle and more ferocious the power struggle is. So the Taliban understand this thing and they also understand that they cannot antagonize major state actors in the game. And that is why they are going to listen to China. They are going to give Chinese assurance that we are going to do as much possible in our capacity to do the thing. But how much would they be able to do it? It is going to be uh, a bit difficult for the Taliban as well. But of course, if you, if you are looking at a comparative analysis, then for the government forces to oust the Taliban or these international uh, uh, extremist actors is going to be a very, very difficult situation. Situation. They may be well trained, but they are not well equipped, and they are not. Uh, they do, they do not enjoy the type of ground power. Uh, not exactly a, a political uh, goodwill, but the ground power that the Taliban uh, uh, kind of in, uh, enjoy and have an assurance in Afghanistan. So that is going to be. I mean, the Taliban are not going to have much of a resistance from the government forces, as much as a resistance they might find from these international actors uh, who are kind of, if I, if I may use a very base term, their partners in crime. All right. Now, Dr. Salma, let's talk about the influence that Pakistan might or might not have on the Afghan Taliban. We know that Prime Minister Imran Khan today, while addressing the uh, Afghan, Pak Afghan media conclave, said that what the Taliban are doing or aren't doing has nothing to do with us. We are not responsible. Neither are we the spokespersons for the Taliban. How important is this statement as well? Well, this is absolutely important because uh, I, I was there at the media uh, uh, conclave and uh, uh, this this was in response to uh, the type of people who are walking into Pakistan, the troops who are defecting, uh, people who are defecting. Of course, uh, the allegation on Pakistan from the Afghan side is that uh, see it were their operators and they're coming back to this country. And the prime minister was very, very clear. He did not mince words. And he very clearly, and there's a lot of confidence uh, and without any malice, uh, had to tell these people that we do not uh, speak for the Taliban. They are an independent actor. They are performing inside Afghanistan soil. And for 20 odd years, 
a military solution to oust the Afghan Taliban has been um, in place and it has not really worked. So expecting the impossible from Pakistan is a bit uh, out of ordinary. But of course, Pakistan has always been pressurized and everyone has tried to uh, kind of pull their weight on Pakistan using, it, uh, using Pakistan as a scapegoat. But the very fact is that Pakistan has recognized this fact and the international community, they very well recognize the fact that it is impossible to deal with these uh, Taliban in this situation or the militant actors um, in this situation. And the prime minister was also very open and vocal in saying it that uh, when the politic, um, military solution did not work, they tried to put in a political solution. But when you are negotiating a polit political solution from a position of power, the dynamics are very different. And when you are doing it with a timeline in hand already announced, half of your troops already exited, uh, then the dynamics become very different. And this is exactly what has happened in Afghanistan. And Pakistan has tried to facilitate peace and stability in Afghanistan in all capacity. Where we have and, no favorites, where hmm. we have uh, no choices, what our choice and our favorite situation in Afghanistan is a stable, peaceful Afghanistan for the Afghans, and that is most pertinent for Pakistan. And this is a point that the Prime Minister hammered time and again, that if there's hmm. any country that stands beneficial from peace and stability in Afghanistan, that country, number one, is Pakistan. Of so course. we would absolutely be invested in a fan peace however that a fan peace is brought forward but it has to be from the one side all right let's talk about another actor that is very important in afghanistan i mean uh, important to some extent that is the afghan government of course uh, but the, uh, you use the word malice while responding to my earlier question and i'd bring uh, take this word and put it towards the afghan government there are accusations from the afghan government uh, of killing Pakistanis in Afghanistan. Uh, it is propagating that the Afghanistan has handed over bodies of 39 militants to Pakistan. And of course, this is a deliberate ploy to divert the attention from what is actually happening in Afghanistan. How can people who are in Afghanistan carry CNIC of, of Pakistan? There are so many questions that have uh, uh, come up as far as this is concerned. What is the gamut of relationship between the current Afghan government uh, as it stands today and Pakistan. Do you feel there's some kind of leeway that could be uh, brought about between the two? Does the Afghan government understand Pakistan's perspective or is it too much under its own influence? Well, I would say that I'm pretty sure they do understand where Pakistan stands, what Pakistan's uh, reality is, uh, what Pakistan is trying to tell them, how much leverage Pakistan has in Afghanistan, and the fact that many of the people who are uh, killed in Afghanistan and they've been given the tag that they were Pakistani militants, uh, uh, in responding to this particular question, the prime minister was that there are still uh, uh, so many Afghan nationals residing in Pakistan and they have their sympathizers and their family members who walk into Afghanistan for various works and they come back and we cannot really control each and every one. We, uh, we really don't know who's a Taliban and who's not, and Afghan nationals are Afghan nationals. They are not Pakistani nationals. And uh, for any intelligence network to uh, fake ID cards is not a big deal. So you cannot really uh, say for sure or to, or to just uh, make this media noise that these Pak uh, people were Pakistanis and not Pashtuns, or no, uh, sorry, not Afghans but uh, Pakistani Pashtuns and not Afghan Pashtuns and all. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is part of that larger maligning picture where the Afghan government, now that it has really no ground uh, support left for itself, it is trying to come up with one uh, diversionary tactic after another in which un the unfortunate episode about the envoy's uh, young uh, daughter yes. Uh, has also, also been part of this picture. So this is just to complicate mm -hmm. the entire scenario. So mm -hmm. to divert people's attention from the dismal performance okay. and the lack of uh, legitimacy that unfortunately mm -hmm. the Ghani government is facing at this moment. And unless and until they try to correct their internal order, Pakistan would always be scapegoated in this regard. It has always been scapegoated mm -hmm. and it will still be scapegoated. And uh, just to make sure that people think that it is not the failure of the Afghan government to perform, 
or to bring uh, the various intra-fund factions uh, to a negotiating table or to have an inclusive government, uh, they will use Pakistan's name uh, to, to their best just to ensure that people think that it is Pakistan which is the spoiler and not their internal problems. And I'm sorry if I'm dragging this conversation to another extent, but there are many Afghan leaders, uh, including the Gilani family and others, who have been talking about this factor that Afghanistan and Afghan leadership must take charge of the goods and bads that are happening inside Afghanistan rather than keep on using Pakistan, the USA and putting the blame uh, game on Pakistan and everyone hmm. to uh, for blame gaming. Okay, a final question, ma'am, but very uh, quick answer from your end. Tariq Taliban Pakistan and uh, the uh, I mean the amount of presence is being given in the CNN interview of Noor Wali Mahsood. Don't you feel this should not have happened in the current context of uh, what uh, the TTP is perpetrating inside of Afghanistan and in the region? Do you feel there's some kind of an influence that the TTP has through backing of important elements or uh, how should I say countries? You see, uh, the very fact is that uh, when the TTP was its rise, Pakistani government kept on saying that TTP has uh, our neighboring countries support and they are trying to uh, create stir trouble into Pakistan. No one listened to us then and no one is listening to us now. And the very fact that you have these militants being given air, uh, uh, talking air and so much of the talking space uh, on international media is, is very uh, is an evidence of the fact that you have vested interest group and you have foreign governments who are through various means, whether it is open media, their intelligence agencies, uh, insider game, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, trying to exploit as many uh, fault lines within Pakistan as possible to make things difficult for us. And I, I right, must say that right. this is one of the very difficult situations for Pakistan. It is a bit difficult situation. Pakistan Thank you very much, Dr. Salman Malik. We're a bit I'm short of time or else we would have continued our discussion with you on this topic. We'll get back to you on this. Thank you very much to, for, for your, uh, of course, input on uh, this topic. Very quickly, ladies and gentlemen, before we go, kindly get yourselves vaccinated and follow the SOPs because the fourth wave of the COVID-19 is upon us. We need to be extremely careful, extremely vigilant in these current days and times. The number of cases are increasing as we speak. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we come to an end of today's newsroom. We'll see you, inshallah, tomorrow with new segments, new stories that matter to you and to us. Till then, stay safe, get yourselves vaccinated, follow the SOPs. Allah Hafiz. Thank you.